Welcome, welcome, Doug, and welcome, Manuel, to the show. Um, we're delighted that you're here. Um, nice to see you both virtually. Um, one day we will we'll see everyone in person, I hope. And um, but just to set some things up, um, Doug, can you provide us some quick background on where the marketing industry is today on these transparency issues? Yeah, uh, what we've generally seen is some progress, uh, not as much as we'd hoped would have happened based on, on what was determined in 2016 by K2 and then confirmed by McKinsey in 2018. But we are seeing some progress. Uh, brands that are being very diligent in their process by including the transparency issues in their RFPs and requiring detailed explanations when an agency does not want to provide transparency are making much greater strides than those that are are waiting on that issue and waiting for that discussion. The, the, uh, the good news is that more and more people are aware of the issue so that they can make more intelligent decisions when they get into contract negotiations. Procurement in many brands is much more educated uh, in this area, but uh, what we've seen is that as, as, as many of the large brands are very sophisticated, many mid-sized to smaller brands simply don't have the folks in-house that have this kind of expertise and those at the at the agencies are going to do the best job they possibly can to maximize their returns on, on their investments as well. So they're kind of outgunned uh, in, in many instances. Uh, so we'd like to see a lot more progress and that's why the ANA intends to re-enter the education mode of this again. Uh, shortly you'll be seeing some things from them uh, trying to heighten the, uh, heighten the awareness of this. One of the things that I've always found fascinating is that when we when we talk to a brand, we'll ask them quite often, have you seen, have you read the K2 report? Have you read the McKinsey report? And a surprising number of people say, we heard about it, but we haven't read it. You know, and that, that that's kind of a shock to me. Uh, that well, awareness is always right. step one, isn't it? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So some progress, but not enough. And and do you think the focus will be more on those mid-sized brands, or or just in in overall awareness and so on? I think it's it, I think that that it's it's you know overall, but I, I, the A and A wants to focus in on those that need the most help, uh, and those are the mid-sized to the smaller brands. Interesting, interesting. Now I, I'm going to switch a little and ask Manuel um, a question because you were quite controversial um, in uh, in January when we were still having in-person think tank. Um, and you, you, when we had a panel on this subject, you mentioned that we were now living in a post-transparency world. Now, perhaps it's semantics, perhaps um, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting observation, but can you talk a little bit, Manuel, about what you mean by that? Well, it, it really depends on how you define transparency and what you mean by it. But let me let me tell you what we're seeing in the market is that opt-in transactions. These are those transactions that are non-transparent. Uh, agency buys as principal, and also um, they they are for profit. So there is an undisclosed margin being made by the agency. These are these have become commonplace. They, I have not seen a. a single contract that doesn't have it uh, and uh, that doesn't have that language in it to allow for that. So what we're seeing is that uh, <clears throat> agencies no longer have to resort to the old models of agency volume bonuses, what we call ABVs, rebates, uh, rappels, whatever they were called around the world, and uh, uh, or to get free space <clears throat> and find a way to resell it to a smaller client that was that, that wasn't as as uh, so, uh, worried about invoicing backup or anything like that. So uh, th that they, they no longer have to do that. All they have to do is they have to put a couple of paragraphs in the contract saying that uh, the client uh, has the option of saving a ton of money with these marvelous opt-in transactions and that they are going to be, um, they're going to, all they have to say is yes at the appropriate time or in some cases just a blanket yes in the contract. And uh, uh, we, then we go in and see that uh, these transactions, when we go back and audit, are perfectly compliant with contracts. They're no longer they're no longer behind the you know under the table or behind the curtain or whatever you want to call them. And uh, these are happening all the time. And uh, the problem with this is that 
agencies are pushing this more and more. They are they obviously want to increase revenues, and I don't blame them. In a way, uh, we've done it to ourselves. Uh, clients are extending payment terms. Some clients pay on 150 days. I heard of a pitch the other day where the client was asking for 360 days payment terms. I'm sure that was, I'm, I'm hoping that was just a posturing and a negotiation. And then of course, agency fees have been negotiated down um, throughout, the, throughout the last couple of decades. So what we're seeing is agencies trying to find a way of making extra revenue. And this has been a perfect way to do it. It's contract compliant. All the client is told they're going to save money and, uh, and uh, they're happening everywhere. It's, it's all the holding company contracts that, I, that we've seen happen. Now, um, what we're then seeing is that uh, clients, once that language is in there, have to learn how to live in post-transparency or post-transparency uh, um, uh, you know, in the old sense uh, world and, and uh, learn how to manage that correctly. And that's what I meant by the fact that transparency is dead and that we now have to live in a post-transparency world. Once this language seeps into the contract, transparency so, is, is no longer a gift. So let, let, me, let me try to clarify as best as I understand it. Are you saying that clients are somewhat complicit, marketers themselves are somewhat complicit, because of this language that is seeping in the contract that allows agencies to put in some of these conditions, which they're not examining enough to realize that, that the you know, agencies are finding another way that might be less transparent to make some money? Or are you saying that clients don't care? Is there something that, that or in between? It's, it's a combination of things plus a couple of other scenarios. You, you have clients who clearly don't understand what's in the contract because frankly, no one ever reads the contract. The, person, the only people who have read the contracts are uh, the people who prepare them, the attorneys, maybe some procurement. Seldom, very, very seldom does anyone in marketing, any marketing practitioner have any semblance or an idea of what's in the contract. So therefore, you can put anything you want in the contract, but if you don't live by it, it's just as good as, you know, another piece of paper in the drawer. So uh, th that's one issue. The second one is that uh, clients think in very short-term um, ways, and uh, they, they're told, oh, you're going to save 5%. Imagine, 5%, when the margin on these transactions could be up to 100%. And, uh, and uh, uh, then they approve these and probably in good faith, trying to think, you know, thinking that they're going to save some money without understanding what's happening in the background. So you have those people. Then you have other people who think their agency can do no wrong. And then anything the agency says goes. You have then other people who are very, very focused on, on just savings. They clearly understand what they're doing. They know that there, there's an issue here and that there's consequences to opting to these transactions. But hey, they have to make their, their year end goal. They, they're looking for a promotion. And as long as they can work to that goal, um, anything long term reveals them. And uh, they approve these transactions. You know, Manuel has hit on, I think, what is the, the key problem here. Uh, it's, it's the adoption, you know, the, 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 you know, they're stuck on inertia. You know, the world was a nice, calm, easy place uh, for decades as agencies slowly got more sophisticated and found different ways to supplement their, their profits because the brands had pushed them down so much on, on a pure commission kind of a format. So they've gotten complacent, very much so. And in 2016, it kind of hit the fan and everybody woke up, including some of the major brands, and, and were a bit embarrassed because they were part of the process at the time. Uh, and, and they stepped in in the last five years. Uh, we've seen some efforts uh, of the various brands, but, but here's, the, here's the thing. Manuel is right that, uh, you know, we can negotiate the best contract in the world. Uh, and then that contract invariably gets stuck in a drawer and no one pays attention to it. Some, some brands that are spending hundreds of millions of dollars don't even do legitimate audits. They just stick, they stick the, the contract in the drawer and that's it. You know, procurement did a good job, legal did a good job, but it just sits there. And, and, uh, largely because, as Manuel said, they're not measured on whether they did a good contract. They're not measured on any of that. They're not measured at the, on the results of an audit. 
when an audit is done. Their, their, keep, their KPIs are very different on how they earn their bonuses and, and, the, and the rest. So it is not at top of their mind. In addition, they're not there long enough. I mean, very often, you know, we always read the, you know, the press about the average lifespan of a, of a CMO is, is relatively short in the big scheme of things. So, so, so a lack of, of follow-up, I mean, that, that would, to me is the biggest thing is the lack of follow-up. The, the other thing that, that I, I think uh, is the case here is a false promise. They, you know, they claim that they're going to save you money, but there's no benchmarking. There's no benchmarking for you to use to see whether or not they've actually saved you money over other advertisers or other brands, or whatever it might be. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated right now with media buying because a lot of agencies have made commitments to media that they no longer are going to be able to sell through their clients because their clients are canceling media. You know, I don't know what the deals they have with the media companies are, but I bet a lot of those so-called principal deals are going to come to bite them because they're going to be holding media that the media company is going to say, you owe me, and they're not going to be able to sell it to. So there's, that's the dark side of this principal buy structure that may come to bite the agencies in the end as well. We don't know. Uh, but the point is that, as Manuel said, there's, there's all, a lot of hard work is done, and then the whole thing is stuck in a drawer. They're not measured on it. The CFO doesn't even look at it. I mean, rarely ever seen a CFO even review one of these contracts. They don't follow it up with their boards. They, it, it's the largest spend they make other than people in brick and mortar, yet it is, it is the, some of the most sloppy uh, compliance efforts that I've seen. Well, it, it sounds to me that part of the issue is that there are a number of different roles and different functions within the overall marketing organization or the overall C-suite that aren't always on the same page. That, that might be one of it, but, but how, how do you, how do you break through? I mean, Manuel said that procurement people are obviously concerned about these things. You're mentioning maybe a CFO doesn't look at it. Does it have to be elevated to be a, a, a bigger corporate issue? Ultimately, um, it amazes me that it hasn't. Uh, but marketing dollars, if I'm a CFO, I'm very comfortable when I can count things very precisely. So I know how many pencils I bought, how many employee benefits I had to pay, what my rent was. It's, it's, very, it's, 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 it's very objectively calculated. That's not true in marketing. Marketing true. is a mystery. You know, it's the, the old joke about which half is wasted thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, it's not a comfortable place. So, but the, 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 the CFO is astute enough to know that I've got to market. I've got to do this. I've got to trust my CMO. I've got to trust, you know, whatever the market is. And I've got to do whatever my competitors are doing. You know, we've always seen that in the marketing businesses. You know, as long as one brand goes off tangent on some kind of strange media, everybody just follows. It's, like, it's a bunch of lemmings. So, so there's, a, there's an inertia there that is very hard for CFOs to, to really get their hands on and figure out. Well, I, I would say that uh, we really, uh, to, to your point here, uh, Deborah, we, we do see a very, very distinct approach or, or and, and or between what we see with marketing and what we see with procurement. Procurement, you have you get two types of people. The ones who just want to make sure the cost is the lowest, whatever the consequences. Then you have other people. Uh, unfortunately, we have clients like that who think in, in long term, uh, in, in with long term strategies, in, in, in terms of what's going to happen with this cycle and the next and the next. And those people are also concerned about pricing, but they're also concerned about relationships and having integrity in the, in the system. Uh, and those people understand what, what's happening with transparency and, uh, and they, they know what they, they need to do either to get the lowest price or to have integrity in the process for the long term. Then on the marketing side, it just, they just want to make sure their brand, they get, you know, they get good measures for their brand, they get their shares off, they sell more product, whatever. They trust their agency. They're still stuck in the 1970s as far as how they, they think their agency operates, which is no longer the case, of course. And, uh, and they really would like procurement and thus auditors to go away. They just want to be left alone and, be, and do whatever they do before. So from a contract and transparency perspective, and also from an auditing perspective, which is part of the transparency process, you have an issue that 
you have procurement trying to get things done and marketing saying, leave me alone. I want to keep on working like I've been working for the last 30 years. Hmm. Well, I'm assuming that, that given what Doug just said about the media and also the, and the cancellations and the financial issues uh, that are, are obviously going to impact the industry going forward, um, how, how do you think all of that is going to now affect these issues of transparency? Do you, do you think that, that they will, um, is this a time that, that there can be greater concern for this? Well, you know, the old adage, you know, don't let a crisis go on yes. go by without taking advantage of that old routine. Um, I think we have to, I think the jury's still out on that, Deborah. It's going to be very interesting to watch how media sales through agencies uh, evolves in the next six months or so. Uh, because if, if they are in fact holding a lot of inventory that they owe, uh, uh, whatever they owe to the, to the underlying media, that's going to be a very tense relationship. And, and they're going to have to sell this. It's like airline seats, right? Same analogy. Uh, on the other hand, if they haven't done that with the media and they, they're not holding principal media in any capacity, uh, then it's going to shift to the media needing to get that airline seat sold before it goes by. And, you know, they, they're all worried now and everybody should be worried in the media business. There's no production going on. We don't know what the series is going to be. We don't know what, what kind of ratings it'll be. We just, we have no, we're buying in the dark right now. And people are not going to do that unless they think they're getting some phenomenal deal. Now, if we go back to 2008 and 9, we had the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. There were some winners and losers there in media buying. There were some companies that took the gamble and they got deeply discounted or, or minor increase costs in, in, uh, in media by going out long, by going out a year, going a year and a half, or whatever it was. There are others who waited and, and they ended up paying a premium when it did open up again because the inventory had been taken. So, the, so that gamble is there. And the question really, unlike the, in 2009, it, was, it wasn't as acute as it is now. This, this is as, as bad as it's ever been in my, my career I've ever seen. Uh, so, so, you know, the, this will do two things. One, it'll be interesting to see what happens with media pricing. But second, when this kind of disruption occurs, a lot of warts can be seen. And I think that one of those will be transparency, but in a broader sense. I think they're gonna be asking themselves, well, am I paying the right amount for, for network? You know, when, when it's allegedly a declining market. Am I, am I paying too much? For digital, when I see the, 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 the effect where, according to reports, 50% or whatever of my, my dollar that I pay out gets to the publisher. So a lot of this, I think, you know, in a broader transparency perspective, forget about the transparency of whether an agency is, is getting a principal buy or a rebate or whatever. I think that this, this, the, the positive from this is that this, will, this may show a little bit more about the problems in the industry because we'll, we'll see more of the of the failures and will and will be more diligent brands will be more diligent in their investment because they're looking at it much closer so the c-suite is now definitely engaged in looking at how these monies are being spent no, that is quite uh, interesting. Know, so that, that i think is a positive thing from this uh, I have, yeah i was going to say why you didn't manuel didn't you just complete um a um a, a media outlook um and a media inflation index um, since this seems to be a, a lot of the focus now, and the, since the cost of media is such a big portion of the cost of marketing, this could be, you're right, Doug, could be construed as a positive way forward. But what do you think completing that outlook now? Well, um, there, there will be issues with pricing. Pricing is likely to go down or at least uh, remain flat. Uh, there's been movement between second quarter and third quarter. Uh, third quarter is going to get crowded as a result. There will be a lot of options exercised on the TV up front side and so forth. And, and we'll, we'll see how that sorts out. But on the transparency front, we are finding something incredibly interesting and, and disturbing happening right now. Clients, of course, are looking at their costs, including agency costs and payment terms. So they're calling agencies, and we, we know several instances of this happening now. And they say, I need to reduce my fees. And by the way, I also need to extend my payment terms, which uh, right now stand like whatever, they are 120, well, I need to extend them even further. So um, the agencies are saying, well, can't do that. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I have a solution for you, Mr. Klein. 
you need to come back to your boss and tell them that you got the reduced fee and the extended payment terms. Great. What we're going to do is now you're going to commit to opting into these transactions more than you have before. Let's set up a specific percentage of, of, of your spend that is going to go through the, the opt-in transactions. And I'll be very happy to extend your payment terms and reduce my fee. So again, uh, as Doc said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. Well, I think advertisers are so focused on just keeping their business running that transparency is not necessarily top of mind. Whereas agencies are also thinking of, of, uh, of uh, keeping their business in good shape and transparency is definitely on their mind. And uh, they're going to make sure that these opt-in transactions get cemented into contracts in a much more um, formal way and with fixed percentages in some cases. Yeah, that's an excellent point that Manuel is making in that, once again, the KPIs on how the brand measures their executives and their success is all about pushing costs down, at least on a, you know, sub subjectively. I mean, it's not easy to prove whether or not you really saved anything, but I, I agree 100% that the opportunity also lies with the agencies. And if they can get long-term, they can get brands to accept more and more of this principal buy status going you know, beyond the, the cycle that we're in now, because it'll come back. We all know it's going to come back. Uh, then they're going to be even, even in a better position than they are now. Um, so then how do you, you're both advocates of, of trying to foster a more transparent and trustful environment with, within this whole ecosystem. That, that's for sure. You've both devoted a tremendous amount of, of your energy to it. Doug, you've taken on the whole trust consortium, Manuel. Um, you, you spend you know, countless hours auditing to ensure that all of this is, is you know, in, in compliance and so on. Where, where, do we, where do we go now? What, what do you recommend? What do you both recommend that marketers should be, should be doing as, as, as they balance the, concer the concerns of today's realities with the importance of these issues? I, to me, the, the first step that needs to be taken is more education. And uh, I don't, uh, even large clients, except for a very small number, perhaps a handful of them, really do not understand in great detail what happens behind the curtain with all these opt-in transactions and with all the, the, all the new agency practices, right? These are the ones that are now coming to light. Maybe they were there all along. Mm -hmm. But th there are two things that really concern me. One is in the opt-in transaction from our uh, side, we have a situation where agencies are buying as agents for a disclosed principle for a good chunk of, them, of, a client, of the client's money, while at the same time, they're buying as principle for all these opt-in transactions, which are for-profit, undisclosed, uh, non-transparent, et cetera. Um, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that while you're doing these negotiations, there could be value transfer from the agent transactions to the principal transactions. Let me just give you an example. Agency, big agency holding company, buying group goes to big media conglomerate. And they say, Mr. Client, I mean, Mr. Mr. Media Vendor, I have $200 million here for the sake of argument that I'm going to buy as agent. I need you to give me a good deal because the likes of Cortex Media or, or any of our competitors are going to come in and they're going to audit. And like when, they, when, those, when those people come in, we need to make sure it looks okay. So just give me a good deal, an okay deal on that. Oh, by the way, wink, wink, I have these other $50 million for you. This is bonus, this is fresh extra money for you, which I am going to give to you but you really, 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 really need to give me a good deal, wink, wink. So no, no, no word has to be said, uh, implying that there's a transfer of value from one transaction to the other, but anyone will figure out that there's something happening there potentially. So that, that's one issue. So the agency is now in a conflict of interest, and the list of conflict of interest, we could do another talk on that. 
uh, is long. Uh, and, I'm uh, noting that. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the the uh, um, so so then then you have an issue there of conflict of interest. The agency might be recommending to an advertiser something that benefits the agency, not necessarily is good for the advertiser. And your your whether you decide later to opt in to to these transactions, value from your agent transactions is probably already been taken out. So one way or another, whether you opt in or not, it's already happened. That, so that's number one. Number two is all the transactions that we see going on with agency related parties. So you have an agency who is on, the, on uh, by contract being transparent. They're supposedly buying from a third party or from some, on, uh, some other party. And uh, lo and behold, they, it's part of the agency group or they have a, a major interest in it or, or even a small interest in it or some other type of arrangement with it. And then they're buying from them and that is presented as an arm's length transaction. And then what happens, uh, what happens then is that the, uh, the, the agency doesn't make any money. It's perfectly clear, transparent, but then their related party which also hits the same bottom line at the end of the day is making the money. And we've seen this happening where even a legitimate third party is being used by an agency and the agency then directs that third party to buy from their own relate from their own, from their own uh, media inventory uh, from another one of their divisions further down the, the, the line in the supply chain. So from an auditing point of view, that's impossible to trace because you hit the wall at the first real arm's length transaction, what you don't know is that that party is now buying from, this, from the buyer in themselves. That happened in England with one of the major, the major groups. And uh, <clears throat> when that party went bankrupt, it turned out that the agency group was the, mo the largest creditor of, of, that, uh, of that media venture. So that's happening as well. So it, this, this, is, this is an absolutely, um, mess uh, from every perspective and unless clients take the time to understand what's happening and how their agencies are working or not this is not going to get uh, this is not going to get addressed so education is number one on the top of my list and then once people know what they're doing everything else will follow all right so education doug we're, we're coming to the the end of our show would would you like to um either comment on that or or really offer what your view is for, for moving this forward. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, David. I, I couldn't agree more with what Manuel said about the education. Again, that's why the Trust Consortium in the ANA is going to push that hard going forward in the next uh, few quarters. Where the, the Trust Consortium is coming out with two papers, uh, one pretty quickly on data, and the second was going to be on programmatic, and we're looking at others we can, we can come out with. And what they are, uh, along the lines of what Manuel is saying is the basic education, because as he said, a lot of the people who are in, the, in that chain of negotiations uh, in the contract realm don't even know what data really is. They don't, they don't understand the issues of programmatic. They don't, don't understand the affiliate relationships. They don't understand all the different ways that this can, this can be manipulated so that it, it looks fine on the surface. And, and when, you, when you finally get around to doing an audit, your auditor is frustrated because we know what's going on, but but you agreed to something that that puts a wall up and you can't get beyond that short of filing lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And while some lawsuits have been filed and been very quickly settled for fear of this becoming more more public, the bottom line is that that you know without some understanding, some basic understanding, it you may you may find a, a opting in is a good thing for you. That's fine, that's fine as long as you're doing it in an educated perspective as opposed to just blindly doing it because your trusted partner has assured you that they're going to get you savings if you do this. And then there's never proof of whether those savings actually occurred or how much they, they were, were uh, marked up throughout the affiliate system. We've seen some stories that, that are unbelievable in, in, this, in, in the last five years. But again, I think that the frustrating part about this, and I think I, I, I'm sure Manuel may feel the same, is that we can we scream from the mountaintop about this and we try to educate about this, but more than not, don't listen. And they end up being down the same road they were for the last 20 years. And they're smiling because they got some, you know, they got their KPIs, so they're looking good, 
Meanwhile, right. their shareholders and their and their companies are being are being uh, denied uh, significant sums of money. No, well, well put. Um, let let's leave it here for now, because it sounds like uh, we'll have to come back on at least three topics: data, programmatic, and then conflict of interest. So let me thank you both. Um, that was an extremely fast forty minutes, but. Um, I, I can't thank you enough, and obviously this has to be continued. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you.